Hi, I'm Anna Popperwell, and you are watching the Permanent Rain Press. Hi everyone, it's Chloe with the Permanent Rain Press today. I am so happy to be joined by the wonderful Anna Popperwell. Anna, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me, Chloe. Thank you so much for, for taking the time and being here. We have so much to discuss, so I'm going <laughs> to jump right in. Let's start with the gallery. It's this upcoming immersive interactive fusion of film and video game. Tell me what drew you to the script and wanting to be a part of this project? Um, well, it was a huge script. I received this, um, this script and it was like over 300 pages long and had this mad kind of set of instructions attached to it. So the gallery is an interactive heist movie basically. Um, and the idea is that it's like a really high spec game with a like more narrative content than you might expect for the average game or an interactive movie or both. And, um, and so, this, the whole script as it came to me detailed all of the different narrative pathways that you could take. And as a viewer, obviously you'll be experiencing one of those at a time. As a reader, you're kind of experiencing them simultaneously because you're jumping back and forth saying, this scene could lean to this scene, this scene, this scene, or this scene, or go back to page 262 and check what, which route you took for this. So, so I had this huge document and then I also had a sort of roadmap, like a flow chart that showed the different routes that the story could take, um, kind of like a, a, a key or a guide. And so actually just receiving that was like, oh, wow, this is really different. Um, and that was the sort of originality of it was appealing. And then the other thing that really appealed about it to me is that it's set in... The, the first choice you make as a viewer, I don't think this is a huge spoiler, is um, whether you want to have a female protagonist in 1981 or a male protagonist in 2021. So the other lead actor, George Blagden, and I both play the antagonist and the protagonist in different time zones. So um, that was also really exciting and appealing, just the idea of collaborating on these different versions of the same characters in different time periods and kind of creating deliberate points of difference, but there's a lot of the same dialogue that occurs across both time periods. So there are real echoes between them. And that was just such an exciting, different way of working. Um, so yeah, that's, that's sort of what, what drew me to the project. You kind That's of very touched on <laughs> no, I love hearing your thoughts because this is something that you know you're not necessarily used to. You've done a lot of TV and film in the past, but and you have done like a bit of a video game, but this is something that's completely new and innovative. Uh, now you kind of touched on it being a hostage thriller, uh, like we know from the synopsis. But what's interesting is the different periods, the 1981 and 2021, they also represent times of social political unrest in Britain. So was this like an added layer that intrigued you going into filming, having that statement or that commentary? Yeah, you, you'll see some of that in, in both time periods in the, in the game. Um, and it's interesting because we actually use the same dialogue for some of the scenes across both time periods to discuss um, social inequality and political unrest. And um, it's amazing how there are some themes that really endure across this 40 year gap. Um, and uh, specifically what might motivate or uh, persuade the antagonist in both scenarios to take kind of radical action. Um, and although those antagonists have sort of slightly different motives, they both have a sense of social injustice in, in their own times. Um, so that was really interesting to kind of think how that might have changed. And one of the ways that we looked at that as well is the, the means by which those antagonists were able to operate. So 
in 2021, there's a sense of um, social media having played a role um, and acting as part of a kind of network. Uh, whereas in the 1981 version of the story, it's much more like a kind of lone wolf character who's, uh, who's controlling the situation. So I read that there are over 150, 150 different choices for viewers or players to make throughout the duration, which is a lot of different emotional scenes and reactions. Tell me, was it challenging to capture, I want to say, the essence of both characters and all these different scenes? Because for each reaction you film, there's basically a number of different reactions or consequences, <laughs> as you mentioned, with that flow chart. Yeah, it was really um a real puzzle to film I have to say um and there were definitely days where George and I sort of had to turn to the director and be like okay wait what where have we come from where are we going how does this link up and Paul Rashid who directed and, and wrote it has the most amazing brain I mean I don't really know how he hung on to everything but he always knew why something was there or which version of which prop we were filming um and so I think it's fair to say we relied pretty heavily on him. But but we did do a lot of prep and we had some rehearsal over Zoom. It was we shot in the middle of the pandemic. So uh, we had a, a week together before we shot in person and then we did a bunch of Zoom rehearsal. But it was a real, it was, we, we shot the whole of one time period first and then the whole of the other time period. But within that, there was, I mean, really, by the end we were shooting, okay, we'll shoot this scene and then we'll shoot this version of the end of the scene, this version of the end of the scene, this version of the end of the scene on different takes. And that's really, you really had to be on it. Um, and also we shot at breakneck speed because we had 300 pages to cover in, I think we shot in six weeks. And that's not, that's not very long for that kind of page count. So, um, so you kind of go home at night and think, okay, I have to cover these 15 pages for tomorrow. And I've shot network TV and that can be a lot of pages, but not this many. So it was really, um, it was really challenging. And um, yeah, really, really challenging experience in terms of brain power, but really lovely experience because it was such a delightful cast and crew. And there was this sense, I think because it was an objectively challenging production at an objectively challenging time in the film industry. Um, there was this real camaraderie and sense of teamwork about getting it done. Um, and we managed to shoot the whole thing without anyone catching COVID, which is extraordinary. Um, so yeah, there was just this real team effort atmosphere, um, which really helped, I think. That's amazing to hear. It sounds like such a marathon, but obviously such an accomplishment now that it's done and it's almost out into the world. Uh, you mentioned kind of speaking with George. I'm curious, like, did you two work together with your characters or did you kind of workshop it by yourself or, or with Paul or did you have a lot of discussion um, like in between the scenes or in between the different periods as to each other's portrayal or did you kind of let it come out uh, naturally on camera? No, we did a lot of, well, I did a lot of work. I think George did too. And we did a lot of work together um, beforehand because there wasn't really time. We, we did find things on the day a bit, but there wasn't a lot of spare time to make character choices and stuff like that um, once we were up and running. So we had originally, originally the characters were much more similar to one, to one another. So male, the, the Morgan is the name of the protagonist and Dorian is the antagonist and the Dorians were quite similar and the Morgans were quite similar when we started. And so it was about finding ways we could echo each other and agreeing on kind of where our characters were coming from. And then as we rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed and Paul changed the script, they became more and more different on the page and in terms of what we had chosen for them. Um, so actually then we found ourselves kind of I don't know whether George would say this, but I think we were slightly defining them against one another. Um, and it was really, I have to say, I, mean, you know, I don't know when else one would have this experience, but hearing someone else deliver the same lines as you three weeks later, it, it was very strange because you'd be in the scene and you'd also be listening 
listening and thinking, oh, that was good. I wish I'd done that. You know, well, that was great. Or like, oh, that makes so much more sense that way, George. You know, it was it was very surreal experience having um, the same dialogue echoed back to you, but through the lens of a slightly different version of the character in a different time period with a different um, gender. So yeah, we, so, so it was very collaborative, but not in the way I originally thought it would be, I guess. Bit of yeah. deja vu when you when you're filming. It's so I mean, yes, yeah, so weird because also you you've learned the scene from the other side. So going back to learn the other lines is quite a strange, a strange phenomenon. And I've seen I've seen one playthrough of each uh, time period. I don't. I mean, I can't. I hate watching myself. So I'm never I'm bad enough watching like one version of the story for me. I'm never going to be able to watch all of the alternate endings. Um, but yeah, uh, but I hope people will enjoy it. It's something a bit different. And I think the, I think that the ability to influence the outcome of the story and um, the relationship between the two central characters is like genuinely thrilling. So I think that creates a lot of suspense when you're watching it. Have no fear. Even if you don't enjoy it, I'm sure a lot of other people will enjoy <laughs> I, it, I, kind I, of watching so. it play out. Um, this is a video game. So can we expect some actions, some stunts going on in this art gallery? Yeah, there are. It's a contained, so it's all kind of in quite a contained location, but um, lots of different characters come in and out in both versions of the story and um yeah there's lots of action which was really exciting to shoot i was uh about five months pregnant actually when we filmed so um everyone was incredibly understanding about that um and i had a stunt double but actually she only had to do i think she was just the nicest woman um but only had to do a couple of the it was the falls i couldn't really get away with but I still managed a few high kicks so I looking at them now I'm like whoa how did I do that but um but yeah it was it was great it was really nice to do uh to do some more combat stuff and I think it keeps the story engaging and exciting so there's definitely jeopardy in them I have to say like women's bodies are super, it's like a superpower sometimes. You don't think you can do something and then you watch yourself do a high kick and you're like, I can do that five months pregnant. Yeah, I was, it was, I'm sure it was like, kept me very limber. It was good for me, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, that was, um, that was, that was, an, it was an interesting experience. And actually it was probably because uh, the producers and uh, director and George and, and the crew in general was so considerate and, uh, accommodating that I think that kind of environment also makes you feel com more comfortable physically being like no I can try I can do that I can do you know we had a um, lovely stunt coordinator called Dan, Dan who was very careful and uh, thorough about safety and so I think when you have that kind of support and encouragement it's much easier to like give those things a go um, but yeah even even in terms of the fight sequences there are alternate versions so for any given fight, you might be learning four different routines or um, and then filming the same angle of them back to back in a row. And so even the, the physical side of things was quite uh, mentally challenging to, to make sure you remember the different outcomes. Well, we are happy that it was done. I know you mentioned it being like a grueling six weeks, almost at the finish line. Ultimately, like what do you hope people, whether they are players or viewers, take away from the gallery? Oh, well, that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, that it's, uh, if I'm honest, it's so funny because I think I spent so much time when we were making it, just hoping that it would make sense because I wanted all of the um, reactions to match up to the different routes that you might uh, take to get there. So I, I haven't really given it much thought about what I hope for it now that it's done. Um, definitely my hope at the time was just that it makes sense. Um, but, ne but now that it's uh, nearly out, I, I suppose I just hope people really uh, the, the like the greatest thing would be if people wanted to play it more than once 
if people were interested enough in the story and engaged enough in the storytelling to want to try multiple versions of the action. Because I think that as a whole or as a piece of work, it, its appeal and its uh, selling point, I guess, is the idea that it exists in all these different versions. So I think if you play one version of it, you're not gonna get the full impact of what it what it is. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what I hope is that people wanna explore the different pathways. Um, I love that answer. And this is such a fascinating project. I am not a gamer, but I might have to pick up a console so that I can be a part of this story. I think that's what's amazing about work like this is that it really bridges that gap as to what is possible between different art forms and, and having that route and letting players decide. I think there's nothing that's more interactive than that. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. It will be out in April and we will let viewers know again at the end of this interview. But let's shift gears now. Uh, it has been over 15 years since the release of The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, The Witch and The Wardrobe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you hear that, what immediately comes to mind? Um, well, I mean, it is a sort of, it makes me feel very old, but <laughs> I'm sure it makes other people feel old too, because they watched it as children. Um, but I think so much of my, uh, my memory of making those movies and the like personal legacy that I have as a result of them are the friendships that I've formed making them. So when, when you say that, my immediate thought is, oh yeah, Georgie was tiny, or oh, uh, I haven't seen Ben for a few months, or, you know, it, it's, it, I suppose it's very, um, yeah, I think that's, that's the like main resonance it has for me now, is the re relationships that I formed making them like tied to the people. And I love that. We will talk about that in just a bit. But uh, I wanted to talk about a couple of scenes that were my favorites in the film, maybe get some behind the scenes insights or, or anything you remember. Oh, yeah, really. yeah. Uh, so the first one was being crowned kings and queens of Narnia, Ker Paraval. It was such a grand, beautiful scene. Do you remember anything from that one? Yeah, I do. Um... Yeah, it was amazing. We shot it near the end, I think. So we had already gone through a lot of the action of the first film. And it was very exciting for us because we'd spent much of the movie in the same costume. So we all had these new costumes and crowns and um, there was some dancing to learn. I remember that. Uh, and I remember uh, James McAvoy as Mr. Tumnus. Um, just like spreading joy and light around the place. Um, and it was really, they, they, it was a really fun scene to film because also there was a set that had been built specially for it. And uh, yeah, I remember it being, I remember it being a sort of celebratory and jubilant thing, uh, shooting that. I remember really long tracking shots on each of us um, as we were being crowned. Uh, and it was big, it was also it was big, I mean, as with much of filming uh, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, actually, it was a big operation. You know, there were lots of creatures there. There were lots of um, supporting artists that day. So it would have been one of those all hands on deck kind of sequences. We spoke with uh, William Mosley, who, of course, stars as your on-screen brother, Peter. I'm not sure if you remember any of this, but he said that he couldn't smile. Like, he felt so fake during filming and could yeah. not smile. Uh, and he mentioned, too, like, about those those long tracking shots, like they were trying to get him to smile, and he, he couldn't do it. But I think they did find some some clips where he might have had a bit of a grin on oh, his face. Oh, really? That's so interesting. I mean, it is really difficult. F fake laugh. I find fake crying, or I find crying on camera much easier than laughing. Um, and I think you can really tell when people are 
uh, laughing unconvincingly, but smiling I don't have a problem with. That's funny that Will doesn't like, does he not, not like his smile or something? What's that I about? think maybe it was at that age, he, he thought so it was just like that. so phony putting it on. He said the same yeah. thing about he could cry, he, he just couldn't smile on camera. Yeah, yeah. oh, that's so funny. Um, oh gosh, it's, uh, yeah, such a long time ago. <laughs> The Narnian theme song, I think he mentioned it might have been playing in the background when you were walking. So obviously such a beautiful score by Harry Gregson Williams. Um, the next scene is the raiding or storming of Mira's castle and Prince Caspian, because that was such an emotional sequence of events leading up to uh, spo spoilers for anyone watching this, but I'm sure you all have watched Prince Caspian by now. Uh, but leading up to that gate falling, what do you remember from just getting the scripts and then actually going into filming? Because it was pretty heavy material. Yeah, that's right. That was quite heavy material. And it was, I, you know, I think Prince Caspian is um, darker as a film than The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Um, I remember that. I mean, it, it was a huge operation filming that whole sequence. It was, and we did it in, at night. So we had about a month of night shoots, as far as I remember. And, um, and yeah, and the, the, the gate coming down and, and, uh, and I remember that being really somber um and uh yeah we, the, we had sort of the excitement of choreographing the stunt sequence i think i got to do some stuff with my bow in in that night raid sequence and then the end of it is that is that sort of sad looking back uh bit isn't it it's really um it's really dark you're right i do remember actually as part of that uh as part of shooting the night raid that Will did the most incredible stunt. He might have told you about this already because it's the kind of thing he likes to talk about. But the, um, he, he had to jump onto a running horse and like mount it while it was running. And I remember watching him being like, that is extraordinary. How is he insured for that? I mean, he was always so, he's so able at that sort of stuff and so brave and game about it. Um, but I can kind of remember our line producer's face like, oh my God, this is, this is, we're only doing a couple of takes of this, you know? Um, so yeah, that's what, well, that's, it's so nice to be directed to think about specific parts of it actually, because often people say, oh, what was your favorite scene to film? And those answers are just sort of locked in my head from when we did press however many years ago. Um, yeah, so it's, it's like nice pre-programmed. So when someone says, what's your favorite yeah, scene? Yeah, like, it's hard not to. <laughs> I know not it's to the... have those things stuck in your head. So it's it's nice to be directed to think about specific bits, um, and it's nice to hear what what things stuck out for for you. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I was going to say, I know you've mentioned it multiple times, but uh, if you want Anna's favorite scenes, it's the snowy landscape in <laughs> the first film, seeing Narnia, and then the battle scenes and the raid uh, in, in Prince Caspian. But uh, I have to ask, or I was looking at actually online comments before this interview, and something that stuck out to me I thought was funny was that some fans noticed that a lot of Susan's lines or her dialogue started with her basically shouting Peter's name. Is that something that you noticed at all during filming that you were calling out Peter's name a lot? I think that's, I, you're right. I, I, so I don't know if I noticed that on the page, but I'm sure there's some excellent compilation to be had of Susan just shouting Peter, Peter, Peter. And we did, Will and I did have this kind of joke going on that there was just this perpetual eye roll that Susan was doing at Peter. Um, it was kind of her job constantly to be telling him off really irritatingly. Um, you're right. <laughs> I was like, or the fans were right because they noticed it. It's just funny because, you know, he did, obviously we know the character, he did make some decisions that weren't always well thought out, but Susan mm -hmm. was kind of the one to go like, you know, what are you doing? Stop doing what you're doing. Yeah. They obviously need to be a team, really, those four, don't they? Because Peter does make some bad decisions, but he's also very brave and, and good hearted and everything kind of comes good in the end. I think if Susan were in charge they'd never have got to Narnia in the first place. So it, it's, um, it's, 
uh, she sort of reins him in a bit, but um, but they need Peter's fearlessness. Everyone definitely compliments each other. I think that's one of the wonderful things about these characters. Now, of the creatures and Narnians that were introduced in the first two films, who was your favorite and why? Ooh, uh, that's very difficult. I mean, I think, I think um, in terms of the characters, I think Mr. Tomnus and Trumpkin both have this like really special place in both of those stories. Um, uh, pop, because they're quite central to the action um, and they're generous to the Pevensies. Uh, and then also the actors who, who inhabited those roles were particularly wonderful. Um, so they stand out for me. And then I, I suppose in terms of thinking about the filming process, uh, the, the scenes with the beavers in the first movie were so uh, sort of sweet and satisfying and curious to film because uh, while we were shooting, we had sort of ping pong balls on sticks to look at. And Andrew Adamson, the director and his brilliant assistant, Lena, would, would read the rolls and wobble the ping pong balls or get on uh, their knees and pretend to be eye lines. And that was just sort of so surreal and imaginative and brilliant to be reading those scenes opposite these uh, kind figures. <laughs> to be I famous. feel like that's um, the perfect stand in though, right? Like for those characters, yeah. people who you really yeah. trust and, and are friendly people. And I, I was about to ask like, what were you looking at? And you answered my question right there. Yeah. It so the sometimes same? it was, if, if, if Andrew or Alina couldn't sort of fit around the table or under the camera or whatever, it would be a ping pong ball. Um, but or occasionally, you know, a piece of fluorescent tape is an eye line. But um, but mainly it was them, and I have this, I have a really strong memory of them both absolutely going for it in the scene. You know, huge commitment to the roles. Um, so shooting that sequence, and I, in terms of like the CGI characters, uh, stands out for me a lot. Yeah, they were invested and we'll give them that. It, I think it brought the best out of all of you as actors. Uh, you mentioned the people. So taking these friendships out of Narnia, tell me, how have you been able to maintain that close relationship over the years? Oh, well, I think we just had such a close bond because we had this huge adventure together as children, you know, so... Um, I suppose Will was a little bit older. I was 15 and then I was when we did The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and then I was 18 when we did Prince Caspian. So I was a bit older, but Georgie was eight when we went to New Zealand for Sue's baby. And um, and yeah, I just, you know, also the, their enduring friendship. So I've seen, we've, we've seen each other as we've grown up and, um, and they're such nice people. They're so lovely. They're not kind of, um, I don't know, people always kind of bang on about kid actors being the worst, but um, they're not. They're, 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 these particular ones are really lovely. <laughs> so uh, so it's been, it's been really wonderful that our friendship has remained. And um, I, I, I see them, I, I, we, we sometimes all hang out together, but my individual relationships with them are really different. So Skander is really busy and the most grown up out of all of us and has a real job. And it's very difficult to get hold of him. And I think he thinks that we're all just sort of still errant children and he's become an adult and we haven't. Um, but it's always really nice to see him. And he's just so, he's such a, a sweetheart. Uh, and he lives very near me in London still. So we both grew up in the same area and then we both moved to our own places, it's still in the same area. So I, I, uh, it's easy to see him when he's around. And then Georgie, uh, I see whenever I can or whenever she can. And she's just, I, I recently, I've seen her since this, but I'm so, uh, I love talking about this performance that she did of a Philip Ridley play called Tarantula. Uh, and it's online, I think it's still, I think it's still available probably um, since it was recorded by Southern Playhouse. It's a one woman show and she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, I mean, she's been good in lots of the, of the work that she's done, but I just was so, I don't know if I was, I don't know if I was expecting the performance that she 
gave. She's just so brilliant in it. So I really recommend that to viewers if you haven't seen it. She's um, incredible in it. And then Will just sort of, uh, it will always be the uh, wonderful big brother I don't have, basically. Um, so he's, he's always having a like adventurous and glamorous time and he's very committed to his work. And, but he'll kind of swan in to London and I'll see him three times in a week and then I won't see him for a few months or, um, yeah, he's always very sweet, always remembers my birthday and um, is actually, he's very good at keeping in touch and um, just such a like, I'm sure your viewers will know because we've done an interview with him, but very warm hearted and generous and lovely human. And then Ben Barnes is one of my best mates. So I, I speak to him all the time, basically. Um, yeah. It's so wholesome hearing you you speak about them. And oh, I know that probably I'm sure very that they would... <laughs> probably <laughs> like annoying no, no, no. saccharine and disgusting, I'm sure. <laughs> no, it's so sweet because, you know, for people like me and I'm sure a lot of viewers, like they just watched you kind of grow up together. And I've been following what they're all doing, obviously, like you mentioned, Skander, he's in politics now, uh, a, bit, a bit more busy. Um, it's funny, I, I'm wondering if you have to like call up an assistant to, to speak with him sometimes I don't well no I've never had to do that but we I I am um, like he's definitely the least active on our group chat I would say because he actually has you know real running the world things <laughs> yeah for sure um but just hearing you speak I know you did mention at German Comic Con in December you did get together at Georgie's she cooked you lunch uh Will Poulter you said was also oh, there yeah. who unfortunately you didn't get to film uh with him in Voyage of the Dawn Treader but he is also doing really amazing things in film oh, yeah and he's the most I mean he is like the most polite man on the planet he's so modest and thoughtful and kind and um what a wonderful person to have the success that he's having because he's yeah he's so diligent but he's also just the nicest guy um so yeah that's really exciting I can't wait to watch him in his new Marvel capacity must have been so nice to see each other after all this time unfortunately Ben couldn't be there uh, but you mentioned he's mentioned in multiple interviews that you two are best friends um he's making music now as well okay. did you get a sneak peek at all I did get a did I get a sneak peek I think I was told that I had to wait until it was finished I think I was I think I requested one and was rudely denied I think it was <laughs> I obviously I was talking to him when he was um recording it and we talked about it a lot um and I was really excited to listen to it but I think he wanted to wait until it was I heard it before it was released but I but not long before it was released because he he quite wanted to wait until it was finished um and he's so I mean he's so talented I've been nagging him for ages being like when is the album we want merch like I'm number one fangirl um so I'm just delighted for him that he's recorded some because I know he does his um he does lots of like Instagram singing and pianoing and stuff doesn't he but he um I think it's been a real labour of love and a really personal mission to um, to record the music he's recorded, uh, and I'm really I'm really proud of him. That's so sweet, and he definitely wears his heart on his sleeve with the debut EP. Uh, what is your favourite song off of it? If you could pick one, um, I actually, I mean, it's not. I don't think it's like the most popular, but I love Ordinary Day. I think it's just so beautiful. That's one um, of my favorites too, yeah. Uh, that's my favorite. Now you still get recognized for your role as Susan after all this time. Tell me, like, has it still struck you the magic that this these films that holds for people, especially for children? Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, I'm always really surprised to be recognised, to be honest, but especially for Narnia, because it's such a long time ago. Um, and I, I suppose it's a very nice thing to be recognised for because it, it's, quite, it's often quite a nostalgic uh, film or films for people. So 
if they approach me, it's often with this like fond memory feeling, potentially Christmassy thing, um, which is nice. And it means that my interactions with people are always quite sort of warm and lovely. Um, so I feel very lucky uh, just to, to feature in, in people's nostalgia. But also, um, I, I, you know, I, I loved it the Chronicles of Narnia's books growing up. So it's a real personal joy to be part of such a wonderful property um, and such a huge honor to be part of delivering a story that's really important to people. Um, so I still, you know, really, that's, that, I treasure that. <laughs> it's not going anywhere, basically. Yeah. Has, has it struck you any different as a new mother yourself? Um, yet I suppose my my baby is little still she's nearly nine months so she's not quite close to watching uh, the films and in fact I, I she'll probably be completely mystified at seeing her mum on screen she'll probably think it's very very weird it's um, probably that thing where she would like look at her mother look at you and then look at the screen and kind of go like what's yeah. going on yeah like I've got nieces and nephews and, and some godchildren and stuff and um their reaction has always been like, what are you doing in the TV? Get out. Like, are you trapped? Are you okay? <laughs> um, so I, I'm sure that will be very strange, but I'm excited to read her those books one day. Yeah. I did read on, on Narnia web that they did compile a collection of well wishes from fans around the world to, to celebrate you and your, your new family is that hopefully you did receive that. Yeah, I got them. And it's so, I mean, I just find things like that completely overwhelming because the idea that that I mean I know that's a very um, uh, tight community. I spoke to one of the guys that runs Nani. Like, I think it was last year, maybe it was the year before. Um, and they're also uh, like active and and close. Um, but it what a generous and sweet thing to have sent me, you know. And I would like really just just very like full of like it, it's sort of a hug through the post basically this bundle of warm wishes and I was really touched and uh surprised and um yeah overjoyed to receive that so so kind people are very kind when you have a baby it's, it's very um overwhelming actually I have to say that it was Will who <laughs> might have let the beans slip in our interview with him. So I think everyone was just hoping he had talked about a Narnia reunion at that time. And then obviously no pictures came out of it, which I, I think as fans, we have to completely respect like you. Uh, we were just happy to know that it actually happened when you <laughs> said in December that you met together and that there was no no like bad blood about it. Um, but I think everyone's just so happy for you because, you know, Susan, and Heavensy is someone that we all looked up to and she had this kind of motherly um, persona to her so so hearing that you had a baby was just uh, it just brightened everyone's spirits even oh, though they don't know you personally so I'm delighted to hear that I mean um, yes Will did tell me that he had let that particular cat out of the bag which is entirely uh, characteristic <laughs> but and it's not it wasn't something I was keeping particularly secret um so yeah that was absolutely fine um I think that we did I think that there will be a picture somewhere because we usually take a picture um I just don't know who has it it's it gotta be been... Georgie or Will to post it though um because <laughs> you and Stan are, are not on social it. media yeah um but yeah, maybe it will surface. You just need to need to nag Will about it or nag Georgia about it. Um, I think people maybe. will after this interview. Um, but just speaking about fans, that you've gotten the chance to meet some of them virtually and then in person in December. So how nice has it to maintain that interaction over a, a rough couple of years? Yeah, I've done all these um, online conventions during the pandemic. And that was really... They've been really lovely. I, I, not that I, that, sorry, that sounded so surprised. I don't mean that I was no, not expecting them to be nice, but I, but they were unexpectedly lovely because there was this um, common experience. 
that, that there wasn't before. So speaking to people and asking them where they were and what was happening with their work. And it felt like it was much more of a um, mutual conversation than conventions sometimes are. Uh, and also something about it being in front of a screen meant that there isn't the distraction of like a huge hall with trying to get people trying to get tickets to this or that or get in the queue for this or um, that there's a sort of bit, bit more pure communication going on. Um, and I, what I really enjoyed is that some people would come back. So I would see people like six months later and because we'd had the chance to have an actual conversation, be able to say, oh my God, what happened with this? And how are you? And have you got back to teaching yet? And it, 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 I, really, I really enjoyed that. I, and I just wasn't quite expecting it. Um, so it was lovely. And then the other thing that I just can't believe is that I do these c conventions for specifically for rain quite often. And um, that's a show that I think in a way that no one, or so I, I mean, maybe some people did, I did not anticipate. It has this like community of fans that still really enjoy it and um, are really invested in it. And actually in, in May, I think it's happening. I'm going to a, a convention in, per, in person for Rain. And it's one that's been postponed, postponed, postponed. And uh, some of the fans that come to that are people who kind of come back and back to Rain conventions. And I think that's real joy to see I think that the cast is sort of incidental to the whole thing at that point. They're just like happy to see each other and um, we're a kind of afterthought. But it's very nice for us because we get to hang out and have a bit of a reunion as well. And uh, everyone's in a very good mood and misbehaving slightly. So that's really good fun. So yeah, they've been great to do online, but um, it's also, it's nice. I, I know there are some people who are really looking forward to, to doing that in person. Yeah. Well, it, sh it should really be nice to see everyone once again. As we round things out, uh, I wanted to talk about your take on social media, which I admire. Back in 2013, you said about Twitter that you don't want to put too much of your soul on the internet. So has your stance remained the same over the years? And how have you been able to consume news in a way that is safe and accessible for you? That's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I kind of use Twitter as a search engine for news because it's very uh, powerful and brilliant in its immediacy you know if you're tracking an unfolding event there are brilliant journalist live streams that you can follow but twitter is often the thing that has the most up-to-date information so i do kind of use it in that way and i i don't know it's so funny because i I don't know that I have extremely strong views on social media, but we live in an age where not having social media, particularly if you're in the public eye at all, is like a very strong view in and of itself somehow. You know, it's, if you don't have Instagram, you must have like a really staunch take against it or something, which is not really how I feel about it. I just sort of um, haven't done it. And I think I... I'm wary of it. So I'm wary of what it does to your identity and how you view life. And um, particularly if you have an obligation to communicate about certain things. So I find the idea quite terrifying that I would be uh, forced to like filter my life with in amongst th views on things that are really important. So I, I sort of, I've got friends where they're like, oh, I need to post something about Black Lives Matter. And then, but I also need to document my breakfast and I need to do that. And I just, I, I kind of, I'm in awe of how people balance that. And I'm, I, I, I don't know, it's such a useful tool if you're um, promoting work or promoting causes that you believe in or, um, charities that you want to champion. So I, I am aware that it's, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a really important tool in the world. Um, I just find it really, I find the idea of deciding what to put in and what to leave out really stressful. And yeah, I don't know, that's not very eloquent, but I, that, that's how I feel about it. So it's not that I'm like 
people shouldn't have social media. Uh, I just sort of, I'm just a bit scared of it, basically. I feel like that's natural because there's a lot of noise on social media. So, you know, if you don't want that added pressure or that stress coming from like both inside, outside sources, it's best to to kind of take a step back. Um, I like that you said you write postcards still. I feel like that's a lost art. So it's yeah. good that you still I do that. I love making postcards and, and post in general. It's great. Um, but I'm such a weird old Luddite. We know that's not... <laughs> someone has to continue doing it otherwise there won't be a mail service <laughs> that's true i'm single-handedly propping up the royal mail basically <laughs> we have one more question for your signature question if you could be any ice cream flavor which would you be and why oh this is very interesting because i have very specific views on what my favorite ice cream flavors and combinations are but i don't know if that's what i would be as an ice cream like i don't think i could presume to personify myself as my favorite flavor so so I'll, i would double answer the question so if i were having an ice cream i would choose either mint chocolate chip or in a like dream gelato world, I would be having a, a scoop of pistachio and a scoop of coffee. But I think if I were an ice cream, I would probably be, I think I'd probably be vanilla, but with something in it, like not super boring, but with just like, not full raspberry ripple, but vanilla with like a little swirl of something not too flamboyant. Is that, that's probably way more than you were. <laughs> I, I love it. We got three answers for the price of one. So that was great. Thank you so much, Anna, for taking the time to chat. This was such a pleasure getting to hear your insights. Not at all. Thank you for your thoughtful questions, Chloe. Make sure to watch Anna in the gallery. It is out this April on mobile devices. Consoles will be in cinemas in the UK. So stay tuned and show your love and support. And we will see you next time. Bye.